Can I just say over us uh, the words, peace be still. Jesus is the Prince of Peace. Um, today is the first day of Advent. I love today in the, the year. If you haven't put your Christmas tree up, today is the day that legally you can put your tree up. When I get home tonight, my family are coming over for dinner. We're going to have pizza. We're going to put the lights up. We're going to put the tree up. And when we turn the lights on, we, we stop and pray because Jesus is the light of the world. And this year, for the first time, we have our Christmas lights. We've moved into an apartment with a balcony. And so I love the idea that every night when I turn my Christmas lights off, it's broadcasting this sense of Jesus is the light of the world. Can I encourage you when you turn your Christmas lights on every night up leading up to Christmas that you pray? That Jesus is the light of the world and that wherever people see lights, something will move them to ask questions or to look for Jesus that Jesus is the Prince of Peace. And tonight I have a word of hope and a word about love to bring to you. And unless we first of all understand peace, sometimes there's a wall between what we can hear and receive. And so there is something going on here tonight for some of you. I'm feeling the wrestle myself. And so Jesus is the Prince of Peace. And when we understand the peace of Christ, the walls come down and we can receive the love that Christ has for us. So I pray you're experiencing that peace tonight. Over the last uh, six weeks or so, we've been uh, dwelling on the theme of faithfulness. And if you were here uh, when Ryan kicked off this series, he preached a great message. It was uh, from Luke chapter 5, and it was a story of Peter meeting Jesus for the first time. And if you remember that story... Peter is out fishing all night and he's really tired and Jesus comes along and says to him, put your nets out on the other side. And Peter says these words to Jesus. He says, if you say so, I will, or because you said so, I will. Now there was something about that that just irritated me that night or that day. I listened to that sermon three times and it wasn't because Ryan's not a great preacher because it was a brilliant message. There was something about those words, if you say so, I will. And so the mark of a good message is when something like that gets at your soul, you just continue to let it ruminate around in there because often that's where the pearl comes. That's where the gold comes when you allow something just to sit around there and you just keep going, I wonder why that's going on inside me. A couple of days later, I was reading in the book of Acts and the story of Paul um, towards Acts 20 where Paul is headed for Jerusalem and then to Rome because God has called him to go and testify and he knows it's going to be dangerous to the point that even people, followers of Jesus are coming to him and say, Paul, don't go, this is going to be dangerous. And Paul is quite resolute and he's going, no, I am going. And that for me was the aha moment. I went, oh, now I know why this thing's been irritating me. Because when we meet Peter uh, in the Sea of Galilee meeting Jesus, he doesn't know Jesus very well. And so it's entirely appropriate that his response to Jesus at that point is, if you say so, I will. But there's a kind of reluctance because he doesn't really know Jesus at that point. And then you meet Paul, who's known Jesus for a long time, and Paul shows a different stance. He's going, I'm, I'm just going because I'm so totally convinced in what God has said to me. Can you see the difference in maturity between Peter and Paul? And at that point, I went, oh, that's, that's why I'm so, I get so annoyed at myself sometimes. When You know when you get those promptings and you think, I should send someone a text message and encourage them, or I should go and pray for this person, or I should go and visit this person, and I go, oh, I can't really be bothered today. That's that kind of, if you say so, I will kind of moment. But the more mature posture is to take, no, I'm going because God has called me to do something. Does that make sense? So I've been, and I wanted more for myself. And I want more for us as a church, which got me thinking about um, talking about faithfulness from the perspective of maturity. And so the best, um, the best prayer I know about faithfulness and maturity comes from Colossians chapter 1, and that's where we're going to reflect in today. But before we go there, let me just give you some homework, because um, I can't cover all of this prayer tonight. So every day this week, can I encourage you to read Colossians chapter 1, starting at verse 3. It's a magnificent prayer, and you will be blessed by reading it every day. And if you can, read it in the message translation, because it's got some beautiful imagery that we will unpack a little bit tonight. But first of all, a little bit of background. When we read the Colossians prayer, it's good to understand what Paul's purpose was. Paul was in prison 
and he was with his friends, he, um, and he didn't actually know the Colossians church. He'd never been there. It had been planted by one of his uh, students, if you like. Epaphras had planted the Colossians church. And I imagine that as Paul was in prison and his friends came to visit him, because you didn't actually survive too long in prison back then unless you had people coming to care for your needs. And so we know from the letter that he was with um, Luke He was with Demas, he was with Aristarchus, who was in prison with him, and they were together. And I imagine that they were talking about the churches, because Paul would have been concerned, how are they going? How are the churches going? Are they staying strong in the faith? And they'd be getting reports back about the churches. And naturally then they would have gone into prayer, praying for the church. And so Paul's purpose in praying for the Colossians church was this. He was praying for what he wanted them to long for. Paul was praying for what he wanted them to long for. So as we read this prayer for ourselves, I am praying that this is what we are longing for. This is what I am longing for. This is what you are longing for. This is what we're longing for together. What is it that we're longing for as followers of Jesus? Let me put it a little bit of a different way. You know when we're growing up, people often say to us, what do you want to be when you grow up? It can be an annoying question for young people these days because when I was a child, you know, there's probably only two or three careers that I could imagine. Now you can have 50 careers in your lifetime, so who knows what you want to be when you grow up, right? It's overwhelming. But I bet you no one's ever asked you this question. What do you want to be when you spiritually grow up? Who are your, you know, what do you want to be when you get spiritually mature? Who are the people that you're looking up to and you're you're emulating their faith? That's a very different question, and I want to encourage us to think about that. What do we want to be? Paul sets us a great example of someone who was very clear about who he wanted to be, what he wanted to be in Christ. And we read about that in Philippians 3 in particular. And in that that passage, Paul says, I want to know Christ. All I want is to know Christ. I want to know Christ and the power that raised him from the dead. I want to live just as Jesus lived. Now, these are not shallow words. It's easy to say these things, isn't it? But it's an entirely different thing to really mean what we say. And Paul lived the kind of life that he absolutely meant what he was saying. I want to know Christ. He was willing to die like Jesus because he was so totally convinced about who Jesus is and the power of Christ in his life. And he wanted to experience every dimension of the life of Jesus. These are not mere words. They mean something. Paul says, I've not reached my goal and I'm not perfect, but Christ has taken hold of me. So I keep running and struggling to take hold of the prize of knowing Christ. Can you hear that longing? I to know Christ to take hold of Christ who has taken hold of me, to embrace Christ who has embraced me. This same Jesus has embraced you. This same Jesus has taken hold of you. And there's this longing to say, so take hold of Jesus. Embrace the one who has embraced you. And what happens when we do that? Well, we start to change, don't we? We start to change because as the more time we spend with Jesus and the more we walk with him, our tastes change, our hearts change, our minds change, our desires change because we become more and more like him and we should expect that to happen. We shouldn't be just thinking that we can just live ordinary lives. No, we're extraordinary people because Jesus has made us to be extraordinary because his life is in us. And so I'm praying that we'll have the courage to live this life like Paul to help one another, to spur one another on. The second piece of background is that just as Paul longs to be like Christ, he longs for the church to be mature. And we read this particularly in Ephesians 4. And, you know, you can't preach any better than you can just read it from the word. So let me just read Ephesians 4 from us, again from the message. He handed out gifts above and below, filled heaven with his gifts, filled earth with his gifts. He handed out gifts of apostle, prophet, evangelist, and pastor, teacher, to train Christ's followers in skilled servant work, working within Christ's body, the church, until we are all moving rhythmically and easily with each other, efficient and graceful in response to God's Son, fully mature adults, fully developed within and without, fully alive like Christ. Is that not great language? Moving rhythmically and easily together. 
I wonder if there's some resistance to growing up in the room. You know, we live in a culture that, that really uh, doesn't honour eldering, does it? It's like when you get to a certain age, you're just over the hill and that's boring. Who wants to be like that? No, but this is different in the Christian life. The older you get, the better you are in Jesus. No prolonged infancies among us, please. We'll not tolerate babes in the woods, small children who are an easy mark for imposters. God wants us to grow up, to know the whole truth and to tell it in love, like Christ in everything. We take our lead from Christ, who is the source of everything we do. That's a great line to remember. We take our lead from Christ, who is the source of everything we do. He keeps us in step with each other. He keeps us in step with each other. His very breath and blood flow through us, nourishing us so that we will grow up healthy in God, robust in love. This year has been incredibly difficult, but when you read these words, can you not feel your soul being encouraged? Can you not feel your heart being encouraged? Can you not see how this confidence in who Jesus is? This is, this is the good news. This is good news for us. It's wonderful. And so I'm hoping that this kind of talk of longing and has whet our appetite to now get into this Colossians prayer. So I'm going to read it from the message again. And the reason I'm reading from the message is because what Eugene Peterson does is he's able to bring to life in a kind of visual way what Paul would have had in mind as the Spirit formed this prayer in him. Have you had that experience where you're praying for someone and you kind of get like a visual image that really helps you to pray? I think that's exactly what's going on here in this passage. And so we're going to see the image of a vineyard that's being expressed in this prayer. Let's read it together. Our prayers for you are always spilling over into thanksgivings. We can't quit thanking God our Father and Jesus our Messiah for you. We keep getting reports on your steady faith in Christ. Another way of saying your faithful uh, walk with Christ. And the love you continuously extend to all Christians. The lines of purpose in your lives never grow slack, tightly tied as they are to your future in heaven, kept taut by hope. The message is as true among you today as when you first heard it. It doesn't diminish or weaken over time. It's the same all over the world. The message bears fruit and gets larger and stronger just as it has in you. From the very first day you heard and recognised the truth of what God is doing, you've been hungry for more. It's as vigorous in you now as when you learned it. We've been told how thoroughly love has been worked into your lives by the Spirit. We can absolutely appropriate this prayer for ourselves. This is Paul praying not only over the Colossians church, but into the church over time. This is a prayer for us, and it's still true. Now, the image that Paul has in mind um, was this vineyard, and, and I like to imagine when every time I read this prayer is that each of us in the church is grafted into the vine. Do you remember the day when Jesus is walking through a vineyard and he says to his to disciples, um, I am the vine? and you are the branches, remain in me. You hear the longing even in Jesus, remain in me, abide in me. This is where the life and the love come from. And so I imagine each of us and myself grafted into the vine that is Jesus. And because I've been around for a while, it's a kind of like a gnarly, old, well-developed vine. Some of you might be fresh new vines, but one day you get to be gnarly old vine too. You know, the richness of the life that comes. And then there's that line about uh, the lines of our purpose never grow slack, tightly tied as they are to our future in heaven. And that's a picture of the wires that go through the vineyard that hold the vines up, being held by the Spirit. Does it make you feel better when you stand up like that? I make you do this, but you know, it's COVID and we're not supposed to do that kind of thing, are we? But I would love for us to stand up and just do this. Because then it goes on to say that the kind of fruit we're producing is love that is continuously extended to all believers. This is a picture of the mature church. It doesn't matter how long you've been following Jesus, but we're all in this vineyard, grafted into Jesus, held up by the Spirit, producing the fruit of love. Is that not a great picture of the church? This is a great prayer. Now, there are just two things I'd like to pick out for us 
um, so that, you, that help you as you read this prayer every day this week. And the first is that Paul gives thanks to God. And it might seem an obvious thing to say, but you know, sometimes we're really good in the church of thanking each other, and we do a great job here of thanking people and honouring people. But Paul shows us something really important, and that is he's not just thanking the church and saying, good job, everybody. Thank you for what you're doing. He's actually directing the church to thank God for what God is doing in and through them. I was thinking about it today because next Sunday we're going to be thanking one another in the church for the way that we serve one another in love. This church doesn't happen unless we're all taking and doing our part, does it? And so next week is, is we call it Volunteer Sunday. And, and I, there's something in me that, can I, can I just have a little bit of a rant here? There's something about the word volunteer that doesn't really sit terribly well with me because I don't think volunteers make sense in the church because actually our service to one another is not optional, (laughs) right? And volunteering sounds like you can opt in and opt out, but actually in the body, God has given us gifts to bring to each other. And so next weekend is an opportunity to say thank you for bringing to the church what God has given you to bring. Thank you for everything that we do that actually is to serve one another. This church is full of amazing people with amazing gifts. Look at each other. We are amazing because God has made us to be amazing and to serve one another. And, and what Paul shows us in this passage is that in thanking God, he's, he's drawing things out of the people saying, I know about your steady faith. I love that you're doing this and I love that God's work is in through you. And I often think, I wonder if, I want to learn how to do that better. Instead of just saying, thanks so much for what you're doing, it's actually to notice what God is doing and call that out. Thank you for praying. I love the way that God speaks to you when you pray. Or thank you for serving because when you welcome me at the door, I really feel welcome in Jesus' name. Or thank you for when you're out in the car park looking after our cars and welcoming people because that matters. And I feel like the welcome of Jesus when you do that. Thank you for being in the sound desk out the back and and for filming and things like that. Thank you for serving the body because I see Jesus in that. Doesn't it make, it's different, isn't it? It has a power about it. And so when you read this prayer and and you notice the things that, that Paul is saying, I thank God for this. And the other thing that it does is it builds confidence because it's not all on us. It's, Paul is absolutely convinced that because God is present, Jesus is perfectly present with us, that the mission of the church can't fail. It actually doesn't really matter what circumstances are. I mean, it does matter, right? It does matter what circumstances are going on. But Jesus is above all of that. He is sovereign. And we must not forget that. The second thing I'd like to draw out is this line, the love that is continuously extended to all Christians. Again, these are not mere words. This actually means something, and I'd like us to pay attention to it. Paul says, we keep getting reports on your steady faith in Christ our Jesus and the love you continuously extend to all Christians. The first thing I'd like to say about this one is that, as Zach reminded us last week, you can't give what you don't have. The capacity to give love is entirely dependent on my openness to be manifesting and to hold more and more of the love of Jesus. Can't give out what we're not doing, what we don't have. In Ephesians 3, I love this prayer. If you're feeling like you're struggling in taking in the love of Jesus, read Ephesians 3 and that magnificent prayer where Paul says, I pray that from his glorious unlimited resources, this is Jesus, Jesus will empower you with inner strength through his spirit. Then Christ will make his home in your hearts as you trust in him. Your roots will grow down into God's love and keep you strong. And may you have the power to understand, as all God's people should, how wide and how long and how high and how deep his love is. May you experience the love of Christ, though it is too great to understand fully. Then you will be made complete with all the fullness of life and power that comes from God. This afternoon I was thinking, you know, I feel like I'm, I'm really greedy for Jesus. <laughs> Are you greedy for Jesus? It's okay to be greedy for Jesus because this is what Paul's talking about. He imagines us being, so, you know, bigger on the inside than you are on the outside, a bit like the TARDIS, right? 
Our souls are made to just be enormous, way bigger than we imagine. And our souls are made to be enormous because there is so much more of God's love that can fill us, more capacity to hold the, the love of Jesus. A friend of mine was once preaching on this message and he had this great line and he said, you know, I'm praying for us as a church that we would grow strong in Jesus so that we can hold more and more of his love. And then he asked this question, so how much can your soul bench press? How much can your soul bench press? Because God intends for us to be huge on the inside, to have this capacity to hold more and more of his love. And I want that for me and I want that for you and I want that for us as a church. So what limits us taking up more and more of the love of Jesus? Well, one of the most obvious things is it's sin. The tolerance of sin. Now, most of us in this church, we're wonderful people. And in the rankings of sin, we don't do the really bad stuff, right? <laughs> I don't know of anyone who's doing the really bad stuff in the church. I don't think that that's really the problem. The problem for us is the accumulation of the little sins. It's the little things that, that uh, the little selfishnesses. And they're the things that constrict our capacity to bear fruit. You know, sometimes I, I look at myself and I think, what kind of fruit have I produced today? It's a little bit small and stingy, which says something about what might be going on in my heart. And it's often the little sins that I'm tolerating. And so I need the help of the Spirit to deal with them. There's a phrase in the Song of Solomon where, where, it's, where the, 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 the song goes, um, watch out for the little foxes, the little foxes that ruin the vineyard. There's sins like these little foxes, and the problem with little foxes is they grow into be big foxes, and they rob and kill and destroy. So what do you do with them? Well, you have to kill them. And, and when you're reading Paul in Galatians, he talks about killing off these things, putting off and putting on the good things that God gives to us. So let's pay attention to those little things because they have an impact on our capacity to love and to love well. All right, so if we're dealing with those things, that still leaves us with a question. How do we actually um, extend the love of Jesus to all Christians? particularly in a church like Riverview that is so big. How do you love people when you don't even know them? How do you love people when you know them and maybe you don't like them very much? <laughs> How do you love people when you disagree with them? How do you love people if you're not sure if you can even trust them? These are real questions that we have to think through when praying this prayer because these words mean something. So what does this mean? Well, here's three principles that I hope would help you as they've helped me over the years to understand that it is absolutely possible to love the church, to not know you and to love you. And I absolutely mean that. Here's the three principles. Number one is that the Holy Spirit gives us all the love that we need. That's in verse seven of this prayer. This prayer talks about the, um, the Holy Spirit who has thoroughly worked love into your life. So let's allow the Spirit to continue to keep working love into our lives. It's his love. Allow him to thoroughly work that in. We don't have to generate this in our, of our own self. This is the Holy Spirit love. It's supernatural. It's a gift. All we do is surrender and relax and abide in Christ. And this love will do its work in us. Have confidence in the work of Jesus in your life. The second thing is that I find really helpful is that if I understand that Christ lives in me and Christ lives in you, then we have Christ in common. So how dare I disregard you, reject you, decide that I don't like you? How dare I? Because I'm basically saying that to Christ. Would I say that to Jesus if he was right in front of me? Absolutely not. So how dare I say that to one of his followers? In the same way that, remember in, um, in Corinthians, Paul writes to the church and he says, Jesus has made you to be a body. And, and we all have different parts to play that show who God is. Each of us show who God is by the gifts that he gives us. And so we can't say to each other, I don't need you. We cannot say that to one another because we are part of the same body. And it's Jesus' body 
So we need to be careful. You know, the, third, the one thing I found really helpful, I call this, um, ladies, you're going to love this. This is for you, ladies. <laughs> Big fat diamond. <laughs> Young men, you need to buy women these things. <laughs> they don't have to be real, but they do need to be sparkly. <laughs> I call this the theology of diamonds. It's really good. Uh, Paul talks about, in, in Corinthians, he says, um, we all reflect the Lord's glory. And he's talking about Moses there. Moses, who spent so much time with God, he'd go up the mountain and meet with God, and his face was so glowing because he'd been in God's presence. He had to wear a veil because people couldn't, couldn't look at him because he glowed with the life of Jesus. I've often prayed that I would have that kind of face, to reflect the face of Jesus. The trouble is being an introvert is that, you know, often the, the, light, you know, the lights are on but no one's home because I'm so introverted. I, mean, I, I, I want to have the face of Jesus, to be so full of the life and love of Jesus that people see Jesus reflected. Anyway, here's, a, here's the end of my story. I once had a person on a ministry team that was very difficult to get along with. Uh, most people in the team were struggling with this person and I thought if... if if what the Bible is saying is true, I can't reject this person. And, and it was out of this passage that I realized something really important. See, when you cut the art of, um, I think it's called lapidry, when you're cutting facets into a stone, the object is to cut faces so that as much light as possible gets into the center of the stone and reflects that. And in the church, each of us is like a facet of a diamond where in and of myself, I don't perfectly reflect Jesus, but together, we all reflect the Lord's glory. It's a great picture of the church, isn't it? We're about reflecting Jesus together. That's why I wear diamonds, because they remind me of that every day. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> all right. So I would encourage us to look around and to see each other as this amazing vineyard of a church that Jesus has created to abide in Him and to know that we can absolutely continuously extend love to one another. And it's out of that capacity that we then extend love into the world. We cannot give what we're not experiencing in the church. That's the power of, of, of Jesus' love. Just finally to wrap up, as I've been thinking about a vineyard, um, many of us will be glad to see the end of 2020. Are you one of those people that think, oh, I can't wait for this year to be over? <laughs> Can I be honest with you and tell you I'm a little bit tired of hearing that? <laughs> and here's why. Because I know that many of us are super tired. It's been a difficult year. Some of us have faced enormous challenges and are still facing enormous challenges. And maybe you've, been faced, you've, you've encountered challenges that are almost brought you to, to beyond what you can bear. And I don't want to in any may, way make light of that. But it occurred to me that because Jesus uses this, we uses this image of a vineyard, grapevines always produce grapes in season and out of season. There's always a vintage crop in a vineyard. The question is not whether or not there's fruit, it's about the quality of the fruit. That's what distinguishes one vintage from another. And it's interesting, isn't it? But it's sometimes in the harder years that the best fruit is produced. And so instead of thinking about, oh, I'm glad, I wish this year was over. Actually, I've been, I've been asking myself this question and I challenge you to ask it of yourself. What kind of fruit have I produced this year? As hard as this year has been, maybe this year has been the best year for you in terms of what Jesus has done in your life. Why? Because when times are tough, we go to Jesus, don't we? Even more so. We dig our life into Him because we need His help. And so I wonder if you think about what has Jesus produced in you this year, whether you're seeing really good fruit and whether other people see. Let's encourage one another by the good fruit that we see in each other. The year's not over yet. There's still four weeks to produce really good fruit, <laughs> a really good vintage this year, and that's what I'm praying that we will do. I'd love you to stand because to close tonight... We're going to hear this magnificent prayer of Paul for the maturing of the church prayed over us. There's an image on the screen of a vineyard and I'd like you to imagine ourselves as a church in this vineyard as we receive these words over us. God bless you.
I, Paul, have been sent on a special assignment by Christ as part of God's master plan. Together with my friend Timothy, I greet the Christians and faithful followers of Christ. May everything good from God our Father be yours. Our prayers for you are always spilling over into thanksgivings. We can't quit thanking God our Father and Jesus our Messiah for you. We keep getting reports on your steady faith in Christ our Jesus and the love you continuously extend to all Christians. The lines of purpose in your lives never grow slack, tightly tied as they are to your future in heaven, kept taut by hope. The message is as true among you today as when you first heard it. It doesn't diminish or weaken over time. It's the same all over the world. The message bears fruit and gets larger and stronger, just as it has in you. From the very first day you heard and recognized the truth of what God is doing, you've been hungry for more. Love has thoroughly been worked into your lives by the Spirit. Be assured that from the first day we heard of you, we haven't stopped praying for you, asking God to give you wise minds and spirits attuned to His will, and so acquire a thorough understanding of the ways in which God works. We pray that you'll live well for the Master, making Him proud of you as you work hard in His orchard. As you learn more and more how God works, you will learn how to do your work. We pray that you'll have the strength to stick it out over the long haul. Not the grim strength of gritting your teeth, but the glory strength God gives. It is strength that endures the unendurable and spills over into joy, thanking the Father who made us strong enough to take part in everything bright and beautiful that He has for us.